This is Agriculture Adapts by Climate AI. Every week, we speak with industry-leading executives, farmers, and academics to get a 360 view of how the agriculture sector is innovating to stay ahead of a changing climate. I am your host, Borna Porshikani. And I am your co-host, Himanshu Gupta. We are a team of climate scientists and agriculture entrepreneurs trying to make farming more resilient, profitable, and equitable as we transition to a new age of agriculture. This podcast is our journey as we explore the hurdles and opportunities that lie ahead for the industry that feeds the world. Just one clarifying point before we dive in here. This interview was recorded a while back and is now being released after Randy retired from her role. Uh, Without further ado, please enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome. We have another exciting episode here for you today. With us, we have Randy Johnson, the director of the Global Climate Change Division of the USDA National Institute of Food and Ag, or the USDA NIFA. Also, the former leader of the USDA Climate Hubs. Before that, she was the national program lead of genetics and climate change, and she is a PhD in forest genetics. Randy, how are you? I'm good. Thanks. And you? Doing well. Thank you so much for joining us here on this podcast today. Good to be here. Awesome. So we have a lot to talk about today, but I was thinking we can sort of start with your backstory and then go into some some high-level stuff about your work and then kind of dig into uh, the more niche and the more specific problems that we're seeing uh, in the agriculture industry today. So I got into climate change in a roundabout way. I mean, like you said, I have a PhD in forest genetics and I was a research geneticist for most of my career. And I came to Washington, D.C. to be the national program leader of forest genetics at the Forest Service in the R&D part. When the climate change person left, I was asked to step in until they hired somebody, and that was in 2009. And by the time we hired somebody, I had already been well-established in the climate change field. I helped start the USDA Climate Hubs with colleagues at ARS, the Agricultural Research Service, and NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and ended up being the first national lead of the USDA Climate Hubs. Uh, when my rotation ended there, the job came open here at NIFA as the director for the climate change division, and I thought it was a, a good fit for me. So three years ago, I moved over to NIFA. So that's kind of how I went from being a tree breeder to managing a climate change program. Very cool. And would you mind telling us a little bit more about what the climate hubs do and what NIFA does? All right. Well, the climate hubs were put together under the previous administration, and their goal was to translate science into something usable that farmers, ranchers, and forest land managers could use. And so the idea was we're going to take all this science and help land managers use it. And we're going to get that to the land managers, not ourselves, but through their trusted networks being, you know, cooperative extension or the USDA service centers that way, because with limited staff, there's no way, for example, a regional climate hub now has between two to four people maximum. And you don't get to see a lot of people when you're doing your day job. You don't talk to farmers. So it's important that we work through extension. We work through the service centers to get the information to land managers that, in a way that which they will use them. And that's the really challenging part because translating science into something usable takes more than just science. It takes understanding people, what motivates them, what kind of information they need. So that was the climate hubs. Here at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, NIFA, our job is to help solve the crucial questions in agriculture and forestry by funding extramural research, meaning we have a budget. Some of that is called formula funds that go straight out to land-grant universities and help determine what those crucial questions are, puts together requests for applications, and we ask people to write proposals to help answer these questions. We get a whole boatload of proposals in. And then our goal is to find the best ones, and we do that by bringing in a panel of experts to help us rank them. And then, given the amount of money, we go down the ranking and fund these things. And So our goal is to identify the questions and then fund the best research we can find to answer those hard questions in agriculture. So a quick follow-up question there, Randy. What are the kind of questions that are being explored now when it comes to agriculture and climate change since a lot, now or since the last two years? How do we increase productivity so we can feed a growing population? And at the same time, instead of having a detrimental effect on the environment, how do we improve the environment and increase productivity and allow the farmer to remain profitable, which is a very difficult combination to go to? So we're looking at a lot of those questions. A lot of them deal with like soil health. 
you know, understanding the processes that happen in the soil. That way, as we look at projected changes in climate, if we understand the processes, we can better predict how the land's going to respond. And if we understand the processes, we can also come up with management procedures to help improve soil health or improve water quality or reduce erosion. So those are the types of things we're looking at. I mean, we also look on the animal side. Uh, a lot of our projects in the past have been looking for the, the variation so we can put it like heat tolerance in chickens. My program kind of works from molecules, meaning genes, to landscapes that try to get the big picture of what's happening. So while our research is also good for, for land managers to help them manage because of the scale, hopefully it helps policymakers understand the impacts of their policy on the landscape. Not that we dictate policy, but we can provide information to help policymakers. I guess just to follow up there, like there's so many different types of problems when you consider the ag sector. Like ag as a whole is a very general term. How do you go about prioritizing something that might be apples to oranges, you know, and giving something a little bit more money than the other, given that there's regional differences across the U.S., but then there's also like some of these issues are very different from one another. So how do you go about thinking about that problem? You know, like I said, we get a lot of input. Keep in mind our budget for the National Institute of Food and Ag, we have 50 line items in Congress. And usually with some of these budget numbers, they give us guidance. So we have certain ditches we have to stay within. And within those ditches, we identify the priorities. We try to get input from stakeholders. And if it has listening sessions, we we listen to extension. We talk closely with the researchers we fund. We try to listen to what comes out of commodity groups. And our national program leaders are scientists that, you know, know their field. And then, of course, you've got different scientists, and that's where it comes is, you know, what is the priority? So there is no one way that it's done. It's just as a group, we have to make priorities, which means we have to work closely across our specialty fields. So I was looking through your guys' website, and there's a lot of talk about how using uh, historical practices and things that people may have been doing for the last 50 years may not be applicable for the next 50. And you see things across the website, like you got to throw the old calendar out the window, you know, throw out intuition as well. We got to use all the data that we got. In terms of that, how receptive are people to that? If someone's been, you know, using the same practices for the last 50 years, are people open to that change? Do they see it as something that needs to happen or is... Is there a little bit of pushback there? The thing with climate change, the real pushback is it changing because most land managers will tell you that if you walk out into your field and the conditions they deal with are not the same as what their parents dealt with. So they recognize changes. The real issue is whose fault is it or is it anybody's fault? And really that question is not important because what's fortunate in agriculture and forestry is as we adapt and be- get more healthy and more productive practices in, in germplasm out there. We're actually mitigating as well. So, you know, by wanting to keep your nutrients in your field, your water on your field, reduce erosion, I mean, all this increases productivity and it reduces environmental impact. So, so the issue isn't, is it recognized? Because I think most land managers who have been around for a while will tell you that spring is starting earlier. And that they're seeing more extreme weather events. I mean, it's like the Midwest. It might get warmer sooner, but when your field's saturated, it doesn't give you any more growing season because you can't get the tractor in there. And, and those things aren't deniable. So the pushback isn't because they don't see the changes. It's because we're using the wrong words sometimes. It's hard to change. I mean, it's one thing, farmers are really good about adapting to weather variability. It's what they've had to do for centuries. But the variability is getting greater and greater, and the averages are actually going up or with terms of precipitation, down and up. And so they understand something has to change. And a lot of what we're funding now here is the social science. What do we have to provide people in order for them to make the positive change we want to see? There are realities in life that farmers have to deal with. It's, you know, making sure you pay off your loan. Something one of my regional directors told me with the hubs was, I said, isn't this a great idea how they can spread this out 
And she looked at me, she said, Randy, you don't understand. One of the most valuable resources a farmer has is time. And if you're asking them to go out in their field three more times a year, it's probably not going to happen because they want to watch their kid play baseball. A lot of them have second jobs. So these are practical things that are going to limit what we can and cannot do. Wanted to dig a little bit deeper into this data question. So it's about how are we getting this information out? How are we getting more data? So is the USDA currently pointing growers towards private and public sector tools to be using? And and what are some of the platforms through which people can be finding these tools? The climate hubs are trying to provide tools. Universities and extension are providing tools of their own, whether it's through grants we gave or their own funds. There are a lot of commodity groups recognizing there needs to be changes. Fortunately, there's more money going out than just from the USDA. Uh, NOAA has their RESAs out there, which provide a lot of good climate information for people in a usable form. We point people to them. If you really want data for research, honestly, most of that lies in the private sector. John Deere can probably tell you more about the impact of climate and weather on crops because their equipment collects a lot of data and it's proprietary. And we talk at NIFA and FFAR about how can we utilize some of this proprietary data to make better decisions and develop better tools. The Climate Corporation has their suite of tools. That's private. So there's a lot out there. And I mean, what we struggle with here is You know, when developing a tool, you need to do it with the landowner. So you're making sure you're answering their question and not the geeky researcher question. And that you provide them something which actually they find usable. I mean, we funded a program out of Purdue called Useful to Usable, which was, so we got all this stuff. How do we give somebody something they can use? And so I'm not sure what the certified crop advisors use. Like I said, I've been high level. I manage broad areas. I don't get out in the field much. I mean, I do get out, but I mean, I don't live out there. So you've seen a lot of projects come through during your time at NIFA as well, at the Climate Hubs. What do you think are like the top three problems facing? And again, very broad to consider the agriculture sector, but what are the top three problems that you see that we've been dealing with over the past few years and coming down the pipeline here? If you fly over the Great Plains, you see these green circles, okay? The reason you have green versus brown is water. And water is an issue which is really, I think, becoming more and more severe. As we see increased floods, increased droughts, as we see many of these aquifers, you know, the water tables are dropping. Central Valley of California, I mean, one year I heard the water table drop 35 feet. The old aquifer might be another 35 years. You'd have to check the numbers. So water is not only short-term, but long-term issues. Look at Nebraska this year. I mean, if you can't get, you know, if the field is flooded, you're out of luck. And it's not only too much, it's too little. We'll see, we're seeing more intense and prolonged droughts. If you look at the uh, risk management agency reasons for giving out insurance, in the same field, it can be flood and drought almost, because in the springtime, you got too much water. And by the time you're getting to the end of your growing season, you've run out. So to me, water is probably the most crucial thing, but that's not to say the others aren't important. Temperatures in there as well, I mean, that impacts drought, especially when it comes to pests. I mean, in forestry, if you look at the mountain pine beetle, the warmer, some longer growing season, the warmer winters has led to a, a massive outbreak. And I mean, that's because the beetle turns an extra generation every summer because it stays warmer longer. And then you don't have the severe colds to knock down the population. And we've had this terrible mountain beetle problem in the West for years now. In agriculture, we're finding the same thing. New pests and diseases are moving north because they're now adapted to a warmer, moister climate. So, and water is part of all of that. Those are the things which, which come to my mind right away. And it depends on your your sector. I mean, if if you're dealing with livestock, I mean, heat becomes a real problem. Dairy, milk production goes down if the key heat gets too great. So, I mean, there's pick your sector and it'll be a little bit different each time. But to me, I mean, water impacts other things. I mean, with these extreme events, we're getting much more erosion, meaning we're losing the topsoil. 
more runoff into the streams, which are going to get you in trouble with EPA if you're not careful. So it's just, to me, that's what I would focus on if I was a researcher, but I'm just a high level whatever. So I want to go back to this issue of water that you're talking about. It seems like a pretty good sell for cover crops, and it seems like something that's pretty useful across the board. Um, anywhere from, I think research has shown that you can get 100 times less uh, runoff going into your rivers, which is solving a lot of these eutrophication issues, which is you know causing these dead zones like in the Gulf right now. And then you also can see more drought and flood resilience in these fields that use cover crops. So it seems like it's something that's kind of useful across the board. I guess, how widespread are these practices today and what do we need to do to push them further? I don't have the data at my fingertips. Economic Research Service, National Ag Stats, and NRCS has better data on that. And they're increasing. I mean, not at great rates from what I can guess. The real issue is going back to what we talked about earlier. I have to make a profit this year or I'm not farming next year. That's just the facts of life. If I'm planting cover crops and it comes at a cost, and cover crops take a, take a while before you really start seeing soil health impacts. I mean, if you're leaving them there, they're, they're providing cover on the top of the soil and it's no-till. I mean, that will help reduce erosion. But, you know, in my quick look at some of the studies, I mean, you don't get an instant return necessarily. And once again, it is very dependent upon where you're doing it. So uh, you've got to overcome that. Prove to me that it's worth my while, and I'm not going to lose money because unless you have something to do with that cover crop, meaning you're going to graze it or you can get some biomass off of it for whatever you're doing, it's not always the profit right away. It could be a cost. And, I mean, some of the research we're talking about now is let's start developing cover crops that actually have a product that comes out of it so that, you know, it's just not I'm planting this mix of seed I I could find at a good price just to build soil organic matter and hold down the soil, but I actually make a little money on it. When you started the interview, Randy, you talked about how there's a lot of research being happening, uh, you know, geeky research as you you used, which doesn't find its way to the growers uh, for obvious reasons. And we see a lot of, in, in our company as well, when we look at the research journals, Tens of papers being produced every day, you know, coming up with conclusions on climate change and, and or impacts of climate change on agriculture or better seed selection. So walk us through, like, what did you do when you set up those climate change hubs and set up the climate change hub? And what are you doing now in order to ensure that the new research that is being done is communicated to the relevant agencies? What we did do is first do an inventory of what was out there just so we could see what was useful and usable and work from there. And with the resources we have, we've, we've only developed a handful of new tools, which we hope will be useful at the hubs. But our goal is really, like I said, working with providing the next level down, meaning extension, the re- crop, certified crop account advisors, our service center people with information to help them move on and develop things. So we're more of a catalyst with the hubs. We realized we didn't have enough resources to be the end all for everybody, but how could we take the groups out there, help them work better together? And for example, in many of our regions, we've actually brought extension together from different states and across their regions, and and they've been able to work better together. We've been a real good convener as the hubs, bringing people together so that they can work more efficiently. And we've actually been able to connect USDA researchers with researchers from other agencies, better connect them with with university researchers. So, And that's kind of how the hubs have had to operate because we're not running off a big budget. Here at NIFA, because we write the request for applications, the RFAs, we've been working hard to make sure that these proposals come in with advisory groups that include users so that there's actually user input into the research up front. We want integrated programs, which mean not only is it research, but it has to include extension and or education. So in writing our request for proposals, I mean, don't get me wrong, we still fund much of the basic research, but we've made a concerted effort to say, hey, you've got to work with extension. You've got to provide educational products. We have to see something that somebody 
can use relatively soon. Because, I mean, the basic research is crucial, but the impacts come decades later often. We wanted to make sure that some of the work we're funding would give us quicker impacts. So that's kind of how we're doing it at NIFA. And, you know, when we identify the right problems, it could be a problem which we think we can get quicker turnaround on and make a bigger impact so that we see results in the field quicker. What is NIFA's budget in terms of funding these projects? Like how much money do you guys have to work with? And do you feel that it's enough or no? It's never enough. But I mean, if you look at the NIFA budget, Congress has been good to us. I mean, we're like $1.6 billion and probably about $900 million of that is competitive. Now, if you're asking how much goes to climate, I mean, that gets really tricky because we have to do cross cuts every year and I wasn't able to find them. But climate can be everything because climate impacts everything or it can be a specific thing. Our undersecretary has made it clear that climate adaptation is important and we're going to continue in that area. And like I said, we do that under sustainable agriculture. We do that under soil health. So instead of talking about it in the broad sense, we might talk about things that it impacts. Because honestly, everything we fund, weather slash climate, is probably going to impact it. But what's fortunate is, if I'm funding mitigation, meaning carbon, I'm actually coming up with adapted practices that will help my field or forest be more productive, be more healthy, and keep more of the resources on the site. So when I come up with what makes agriculture more adaptive to a changing climate, it's also going to sequester more carbon. So, Awesome. Thanks so much. We really learned a lot today. Appreciate it, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Thanks so much, guys. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you have any feedback or you'd like to add your own two cents on the topic discussed today, or if you've just got your own ideas about something that we should discuss in the future, please feel free to shoot me an email at podcast at climate.ai. At its core, this podcast is just a way for us to learn and we want to share our learnings as we go. So we're always open to building on these conversations and hearing new perspectives. Thanks for your support and see you next time.